Um, I'd like to welcome everybody uh, to tonight's lecture uh, in this, the um, Michael Heseltine Lecture Rooms of the University of Cambridge. Um, tonight's lecture will be given by Professor Mountford, who will be joining us shortly. Um, first of all, uh, a few little rules about the use of the uh, lecture room. Um, uh, it's required that you do not smoke, um, and it is most important that if you are taking notes, that you use pencils and do not use ink pens, as this will affect uh, the fabric of the seats. Um, tonight's lecture is the fifth in a series of lectures um, dealing with issues of paranormal phenomena in relationship to literature. Um, so, without further ado, I'm going to hand over the lecture now uh, to Professor Mountford, who will begin his talk. Thank you. Is this working? Is this working? Can, can you hear me? Good. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to thank my colleague for that rather wonderful introduction. Um, and as he said, uh, I will be dealing uh, a little bit with ideas of, of ghosts for tonight's lecture, uh, although perhaps not exclusively. Um, the lecture will be fairly wide-ranging, I think, uh, I, 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 I hope, um, and it will cover many things and maybe leave other things totally unanswered. Um, I have a few books here which I will be talking about. Uh, please forgive me, my, my assistant was not very good at uh, getting the books ready for me, I'm afraid. Um, so they are all in a bit of disorder. There. I think that's all of them. Oh no, here's another one. <laughs> Oh, so many books, so many books. What will we do without books? Um, so, I'd like to begin um, by a remembrance of a question that somebody once asked me, um, which was, uh, do you believe in ghosts? Professor. Um, and I thought about this question quite clearly and for some time. Um, and I realized that at the heart of the question was a problem. For if you say to me, do I believe in ghosts? I want to know what you mean by a ghost. For example, if you said to me, do I believe in Australia? I would be able to know what you were referring to. Australia, large country, full of kangaroos, 
lots of men who like to drink beer. So I would have an idea uh, of exactly what you meant by asking me whether I believed in Australia. There are people who do not believe in Australia, um, but that is another matter. How you cannot believe in a country, I just do not know. But such things happen. So, if you ask me if I believe in ghosts, I'm faced with the problem of understanding what you mean by do you believe in ghosts? It raises a number of difficulties right at the very beginning. However, I think it's more important to draw on to the literary side of tonight's lecture. Um, as you can see, we've got a nice uh, series of images behind me, which are being projected from that rather nice projection machine over there above the back row of seats. Um, I hope the projection man can see me. Can you? Yes, that's good. Um, and if you're going to leave out of the back exits, could you please be aware of uh, the fact that your shadow will cover the images I'm going to show, which might make things a bit difficult for those of you who are interested in my talk. Um, so with that in mind, uh, I've decided today to uh, look at this uh, rather amateur little story, um, which I discovered in a uh, small magazine. Um, I think it's a student magazine, with all that that unfortunately implies about stealing ideas from others and not really knowing what one is talking about. Um, however, I think it does allow us to look at um, certain kinds of things in a, perhaps, I hope, interesting way. Um, so, the title uh, of the uh, particular piece um, is, uh, well, actually has very little relationship at all to the rest of the text. Um, perhaps it was a, a problem when uh, the student was typing it, um, or maybe, maybe he was not thinking very clearly. Um, but anyway, the title is an anatomy of melancholy. Now, instantly, uh, we are brought uh, to a number of very interesting books. Um, the Anatomy of Melancholy itself, uh, which was a book written by Robert Burton many, many years ago, um, and is interesting in itself for the fact that it is uh, almost uh, a library in a book, if you see what I mean. In that, um, although it is a book based on the idea of anatomizing melancholy, which actually means to take something apart and examine how it works, um, it ranges much, much more widely over many, many subjects. In fact, I think an argument could be made that it ranges over too many subjects. But then, I don't think that should really be a problem. After all, attempting to know too much might be better than 
trying to know very little. What now matter? I enjoy reading the anatomy of melancholy, although it's not something that you can read um, in a kind of story sort of way. And at the end of it, you are not going to find out very much about melancholy. But you will find a lot of things about a lot of things. Which, after all, is what a library should be. Um, behind me uh, is a rather nice image of the frontispiece of uh, the anatomy of melancholy. Um, which you can see is a, uh, a memento mori, that is um, an image uh, that is there to make you think about death. And I suppose there's nothing more melancholy than that thought in itself. Especially when one reaches my age. Perhaps it might be an idea to think about what melancholy itself means. In this case, I must admit this microphone is terribly annoying. There. So I am reading here from um, Francis Yates' rather wonderful book, uh, The Occult Philosophy in the Elizabethan Age, um, which I do recommend to you, and it is on some of the undergraduate reading lists, uh, though I suppose many of you have not even looked at the reading list, never mind uh, the books. But, however, um, let us read uh, a little something here, um, which is about uh, melancholy itself. Melancholy has such power that they say it attracts certain demons into our bodies, through whose presence and activity men fall into ecstasies and pronounce many wonderful things. This occurs in three different forms, corresponding to the threefold capacity of our soul, namely the imagination, the rational, and the mental. For when set free by the melancholy, the soul is fully concentrated in the imagination, and it immediately becomes a habitation for the lower demons, from whom it often receives wonderful instructions in the manual arts. Then we can see quite unskilled men, perhaps like the person who made this lectern here, suddenly become a painter or an architect or a quite outstanding master in an other art of some kind. If the demons of this species reveal the future to us, they show us matters relating to natural catastrophes and disasters. For instance, approaching storms, earthquakes, cloudbursts, or threats of plague, famine, and devastation. But when the soul is fully concentrated in the reason, it becomes the home of the middle demons. Thereby it attains knowledge of natural and human things. Thus we see a man suddenly becomes a philosopher, a physician, or an orator. Under future events, they show us what, co what concerns the overthrow of kingdoms, and the return of epochs, prophesying in the same way that the Sibyl prophesied to the Romans. But when the soul soars completely to the intellect, it becomes the home of the higher demons, from whom it learns the secrets of divine matters, as for instance the law of God, the angelic hierarchy, and that which pertains to the knowledge of eternal things and the soul's salvation. So, as you can see from this classification dealing with melancholy, there are relations to some of the imagery um, which we can see 
now projected behind us. Whether any of this is of use to thinking about melancholy or indeed about the text here, uh, I will leave that up to you to ascertain. With this in mind, um, let us begin to examine more closely um, this text. There is a secondary title to this piece um, which talks about ghost libraries. Um, I'm not exactly sure what is meant by that, um, but perhaps if we read this and think through what is here, uh, we will be able to find some meaning in that title. So, I will begin. Two visions haunt me. The first is of the interior of a vast circular library with balconies that run the entire length of the walls, uh, a bit like the, the library outside of this building, I think. Um, each with shelves of books reaching to the base of the next balcony. When you stand in the centre of this place, you are surrounded by books and by the knowledge the books contain. I think in this case, uh, we can see that uh, the author is uh, perhaps referring to the rather wonderful um, Picton Library uh, in Liverpool. Uh, Liverpool is a city in the north of England, which um, I'm sure many of you probably do not know, um, but Nonetheless, it does have some very interesting um, public buildings uh, which are for the use of, of people to attempt to, uh, to extend their education, which, uh, as Liverpool is in the north, of course, their education is, um, is quite, quite poor. Um, however, the Picton Library, um, as uh, I think you can see on the image behind me, uh, I, I think that's out of focus. Could you try and focus it, please? Yeah, yes, that's better now. Thank you. Um, I apologise. Uh, I, I only really sorted out these uh, slides um, earlier today. Um, so I don't think uh, there's been a proper run through of them. Um, if any are upside down, I, I further apologise. Um, and there's a note here about the Picton Library, um, which also talks about um, the author attempting to find a book called uh, The Order of Things. Uh, which uh, I am assured is by um, a French person called Foucault, I think. Uh, I think he's well known to, to those of you who, who study arts. Um, but I've, I've never read anything. I've, I've never read anything knowingly that's French, to be perfectly honest. Uh, but... Um, no, wine's quite nice. Penny, uh, yes. Uh, where was I? Oh, yes. Um, and the note here talks about uh, the author not really caring if he finds the book. Um, for what was exciting was the wandering within the library. Um, and I'm sure that many of us can, um, can relate to this to this idea that if one goes into a library, perhaps it is the wandering through it that is more exciting than merely going directly to a shelf and picking the book that you, you think you may have needed. Um, I think this is why uh, 
reading the card index is perhaps sometimes more interesting than finding the book. Um, there's also a mention here of a, of a, of a book called uh, The Library of Babel. Um, sorry, not a book, it's a, it's a short story um, by Borges. And I, I think I might have, uh, have it here somewhere. Oh yes, here it is. That's rather good, isn't it? I'm... Sometimes it's rather useful if one asks students to find things, because they, they often do it much better than I do. Um, uh, the Library of Babel is a very interesting story indeed. Um, discussing, in fact, a, a, a library that has every book that it is possible to have in it. Um, And the description of the library is, is quite, quite fascinating. Right. So, for example, uh, this is like somebody reporting on the library. This thinker observed that all the books, no matter how diverse they might be, are made up of the same elements. The space, the period, the comma, the 22 letters of the alphabet. He also alleged a fact which travellers have confirmed. Um, I should point out that the library is so large that uh, people um, travel through it um, much in the way that one attempts to travel through London, um, hopefully but um, not really expecting to reach one's destination. Um, in this library, that is the library Borges talks about, there are no two identical books. Um, and from this incontrovertible premise, um, he deduced that the library is total and that its shelves register all the possible combinations of the 20 odd orthographical symbols, a number which, though extremely vast, is not infinite. In other words, all that it is given to express in all languages, everything, the minutely detailed history of the future, the archangel's autobiographies, the faithful catalogue of the library, thousands and thousands of false catalogues, the demonstration of the fallacy of those catalogues, the demonstration of the fallacy of the true catalogue, the Gnostic gospel of the Basilides, the commentary on that gospel, the commentary on the commentary on that gospel. Um, that idea of a library that is so vast that it contains everything is fundamentally fascinating, I think. Um, for it, it says something quite interesting about um, books and libraries themselves, um, and perhaps something that is important. Um, that within the library one can find everything, much as within the text of The Anatomy of Melancholy, which I'm sure you recall we began with, um, one can find not just talks about melancholy, but talks about practically everything. I remember once um, going to a rather nice house on the outskirts of Nottingham, which, like Liverpool, is a city in the north. Um, perhaps not a recommended place to go to. Um, but there's a rather beautiful house there um, from the Elizabethan period. Uh, and I discovered the, um, that that house's name is actually in the anatomy of melancholy almost as if the anatomy of melancholy itself um, contains everything uh, there is to be. Um, uh, yes, I think, yes, there's a nice, nice image of shelves of books, uh, which um, 
this image comes from uh, the um, the storage areas of Wollerton Hall, which for some reason appears to contain everything. Maybe Wollerton Hall is the Library of Babel. Although what that is doing in Nottingham, I have no idea at all. Let us return to this text here. As the vision clarifies, I realise that the lower balconies, that is of the library he is describing, are only accessible by open spiral staircases and that the higher floors cannot be reached. This fills me, that is the author, not me. Um, I think we need to make this distinction here that I am reading this, I am not the author, because then we will get very confused uh, at a later date. Um, although, obviously, as undergraduates, you are permanently confused. Um, thank you. This fills me with a mix of terror and sorrow, for I cannot articulate the feelings of loss combined with the fear of the unknown, unreachable knowledge that may destroy my prevailing view of the world. Um, I'm sure we may all have had that feeling that um, when one opens uh, an unknown book, um, that there is this momentary sense of terror, that there might be something in there that will make you question what you assumed. Um, this may be why the leaders of major company of companies, well yes, the leaders of major companies, but I was thinking more of political leaders, but perhaps business leaders might also fit into this category, um, that they tend on the whole not to read because they need to have this idea that they know everything. The second vision is of an abandoned library with empty bookcases that demonstrate the irredeemable absence of books. This is something more than loss, for that would mean there was some understanding of what had gone. This is a profound absence as if knowledge had never existed, the end of all cognition. I think that idea of an abandoned library, finding an abandoned library, um, is extremely distressing. Um, whenever I've seen, uh, I think, even an empty shelf where there once were books is a a fairly distressing experience, for without books, how can one live? Um, but no matter. Um, I think in this, this particular bit here, uh, the author is, is um, catching something that is um, essential about our relationship, not only with books, but with knowledge itself. And as we know, Books contain knowledge, and knowledge is contained in books. Um, although there are some in the science department who assure me that soon there will be machines that will contain knowledge. I, I cannot see that myself. I think they might contain information, but that's not the same as knowledge. Nonetheless, this idea of the emptiness of a space that once contained things, I think is distressing in the extreme. Almost like when one goes to a university and there is nothing there. You will excuse me for a minute, I need a little drink. Um, please do not move. Normally I'm provided with a cup of tea or 
In the last university I talked at, they provided me with a glass of wine, which was welcome but unsettling because I, I nearly fell off the lectern at the end of my lecture. Entertaining but distressing. Oh, that water is disgusting. Where did you get this water from? Really? Well, I think if you're going to invite me to do a talk, you could at least provide something a bit better. Thank you. I'm sorry. Could we move on to the next slide, please? Thank you. We now move on to something which I think is more like a story rather than being an endless series of um, random thoughts accidentally put together. This, this first part, in fact, reads a little bit like an undergraduate first year essay. Um, and I would certainly probably fail this student. So let us return to the story. It was at the close of the last century that I first encountered the metaphor of knowledge being likened to an endless series of rooms, so that no sooner had you begun the exploration of all that one room contained, when you became aware of the open doors that led to further rooms to be explored. Um, the author here says that he thinks that this image came from uh, a play um, by somebody called Howard Brenton, who I think is one of those angry young men. Uh, um, nonetheless, the image itself is an interesting one, um, for it demonstrates rather beautifully that um, no matter what you know, you will always find other things to know. Um, those of us who have managed to climb the greasy pole of academe um, know this only too well um, that no matter what you know you will always find more to know um, I see I see my colleague from the science department is laughing at me there um, for he assures me that soon at the end of this century we will know all there is to know um, and that um, physics, which is his speciality, um, will no longer need to involve itself with attempting to understand the world. I hope he's right. The implication was that it was impossible to know everything, for there would always be more something perhaps unknown and unexpected. Uh, you see what I mean here. Um, it is the architectural quality of this metaphor that draws me. That draws me to it, I'm certain. Oh, this is terribly written. That in the image of knowledge is something contained in fitfully lit rooms accessed only via seldom used corridors. Um, yes, I think, uh, I think if, if one thinks about a book, for example, um, this book here, um, then it is within itself uh, a space. When one opens it up and begins to read the text, um, one is accessing not just knowledge, but time and space as well. Um, and that perhaps is one of the most um, fascinating things about reading any book that we are removed from where we are now and taken somewhere utterly different. Those in the front row are thinking of going somewhere utterly different which involves drink. I would be happy if you would stay there. Thank you. Anyway, um, so this image as knowledge contained in rooms accessed only via seldom used corridors um, can be seen as fitting museums and libraries, 
Museums and libraries fit this metaphor to perfection, with their rooms drawing you to follow a specific path, a, a teleology of ep epistemology. Um, so this idea that as you are journeying through the space of a museum, for example, the university museum itself, um, which appears to be closed most of the times I try to get to it. Um, but as you go through it, um, you can see the development of things. So that knowledge is not just um, situated at knowing something now, it is also this idea that this knowledge is um, building up on previous knowledge, so that as you go through the museum, um, you can see that you're being told, um, in the correct manner, of course, um, the, uh, the evolution of something, the evolution of thought, um, somewhat similar to what it is like to study in a university, I presume. Ease of access to information for the visitor is paramount to the existence of these institutions, um, that is, uh, museums. There's a rather interesting little note here um, which talks about how um, museum design uh, shows this to uh, perfection. Um, and it does mention uh, a book called, uh, oh, here it is, uh, the, the Birth of the Museum, um, which uh, does discuss uh, rather wonderfully um, um, how museums um, not only um, lay out knowledge, uh, but perhaps um, um, they control the kind of knowledge that is there. Um, so, as the author here says, um, that Museums can be seen as relating to a, a disciplinary society. Um, this general characterization of the modality of power in modern society has proved one of the more influential aspects of Foucault. Oh, Foucault! Oh, I think I mentioned him before, didn't I? See, oh yes, um, of Foucault's work. Yet it is an incautious generalization are one produced by a particular kind of misattention, for it by no means follows from the fact that punishment has ceased to be a spectacle, that the function of displaying power, of making it visible for all to see, has itself fallen into abeyance. Um, indeed, the Crystal Palace, uh, yes, there's a nice image of the Crystal Palace behind me, thank you. Um, might serve as the emblem of an architectural series which could be ranged against that of the asylum, the school and the prison, in its continuing concern with the display of objects to a great multitude here. Uh, and uh, further, uh, a very interesting point is made here about um, museums, of which the Crystal Palace surely must be seen as one, but it is an exhibitionary place, um, that the Crystal Palace reversed the panoptical principle by fixing the eyes of the multitude upon an assemblage of glamorous commodities. Um, the panopticon was designed so that everybody could be seen. The Crystal Palace was designed so that everyone could see. Um, and uh, as the author uh, mentions here, it's not quite as simple as that. Um, for in a museum, there's also the idea of um, people being seen to act correctly. So if museums can be seen as um, showing, uh, showing objects to, to attempt to strengthen the power of the state, um, uh, which I don't think the museum and the university does, and perhaps it does it to strengthen the university. Um, but for example, uh, the British Museum, which I'm sure some of you know is in London, um, although I think many of you don't go to London. Um, 
But there, there's also this idea of not only do you go to see the objects, but you go to be seen to see the objects. You are yourself on display, and thereby you are also being controlled by that visibility. It is an interesting idea, and one that I think needs more thinking. However, let us return to this. So, ease of access to information for the visitor is paramount to the existence of these institutions, that is, the museum and the library. Yet, when you are employed in such an institution, you soon discover that this primary route through the cabinets of objects or the shelves of books is but one of the many that could be taken on that there are side rooms and dimly lit corridors that lead you to places seldom visited. Um, this is especially true of the older museums and uh, libraries, I think. Um, many abandoned stacks can be found if you wander off the expected routes of rather unpleasant novels and easy to access pictures of major artworks. But even this is to discover only what is available to the general public. For there are also rooms that are barred except to researchers who wish to explore further their particular area of knowledge. Um, I think those of us who work in academe um, will know this. Um, oops. Uh, if anybody picks that up from underneath the stage, um, could you please uh, put it in my office later um, as I'm... I might use this uh, text uh, as, a, um, as an article in the forthcoming uh, Oxford book of cultural studies. Um, this idea of um, there being hidden spaces in museums um, is used to pick up uh, a little note here which is about the, the design for the Natural History Museum in, in, again in London. Um, although here um, there is a rather nice natural history um, selection but perhaps not contained in a room, in a space, in an architecture as um, fascinating as that of the Natural History Museum um, at South Kensington. Uh, the designs for that Natural History Museum are themselves quite interesting um, for they, uh, uh, they show not only a museum that shows objects um, but also a museum um, that showed objects in such a way that the viewer could see through the cabinet um, and see the researchers on the other side interacting with those objects. Um, which I think is a, a remarkably modern idea. Um, and I am, I am surprised that this idea uh, originates in the 19th century. Um, I do not know uh, what kind of things one could uh, see as happening now that are similar. Most museums and galleries are distinctly boring, I think you'll find. Um, I, I have tried to talk to the professors of architecture about this, but they, they have a love of concrete that baffles me. These closed rooms, with only a fading sign on the door or affixed to the wall to indicate what treasures may lie within, exert a fascination for a dreamer such as I, that is the author, not myself. Of course, I am not a dreamer. Um, one cannot work in a university and be a dreamer, obviously. Um, universities require much more than just imagination. Someone for whom the idea of the library site of possible wonders draws me to these institutions in the first place, uh, something I think we can all agree with. It did not take long to grasp the general layout of the public areas of the building, the manner in which the architecture was designed to lead a visitor to follow 
a specified route to promote the official narrative. However, has anyone who's attempted to produce a linear description of the cultural manifestations of a civilization can attest such singular routes are misleading? Um, and I'm sure those of you in the anthropology department will understand this perfectly well. It was possible to discover rooms that seemed to lead away from the main corridors. These rooms containing objects now regarded as merely the traces of ideas that no longer added to the present understanding with the development of culture. Um, and I think uh, we can see here that this, uh, this particular idea um, about um, different ways of thinking about the development of culture um, can be seen uh, as perhaps a coded uh, critique of, uh, of the other university, um, which still retains that very strange museum called the Pitt Rivers Museum, um, which is remarkably outdated, so I am assured, although full of beautiful things, it is, it is more like something out of a very bad 1930s film rather than being anything that could possibly be a place where one can really um, engage in, in research of the highest level. However, um, behind me is a rather nice image of the Pitt Rivers Museum. Um, yes, you can see the objects and um, how it is laid out and strangely lit, I think. Um, I, I do enjoy going to the Pitt Rivers Museum, I must admit. It is a kind of guilty pleasure, rather like that glass of port at night. Um, but, no matter. These seldom visited rooms were my especial joy. From the dusty shelves could be discovered volumes of uncertain provenance. And these allowed me to weave my own stories rather than be constrained by an adherence to official histories. Um, now, uh, I, I will point out that this is fiction. And that one should not discount the things that one is told um, by one's um, elders and indeed betters. Uh, we have not spent our time um, writing long and incomprehensible PhDs uh, for undergraduate students to ignore what we say. Um, we do have a little bit of knowledge. Um, and undergraduate students are not really encouraged um, to think for themselves, nor for that matter are postgraduate students. Um, nonetheless, um, within the idea of fiction, one can perhaps see that this can be allowed. Museums and libraries often contain much more than the things that are displayed or available for public purview. In the building in which I worked at the time of this narrative, that is the narrative of the story, the offices, storage rooms, archives, and private collections that lay behind the public areas were a complex warren where it was possible to become completely lost. Yes, there's an that is not an image of a rabbit warren, which would be quite strange. Um, that's an image of um, the architectural model of uh, the library of uh, one of the newer universities, which I think sums up perfectly well um, the complexity of such places without any meaning. Those that worked in this area knew only of their immediate surroundings finding it no doubt unnecessary to explore the archives and libraries of the curators of the lesser known disciplines. Even those who ventured between departments kept to well-defined routes, and curators would limit their explorations to the archives and libraries containing the volumes 
dealing mostly with the modern period. Um, I think this is a, an extremely important point um, that um, curators and librarians should really stick to the areas of expertise um, and not venture beyond that into things that do not properly concern them. To return to the narrative, I'm sure you think it's unlikely that a modern building will contain such mysterious areas as those alluded to above. Yet you should also recall that the new building you encounter today, um, this building is not particularly new, but there is a new building on the other side of the quad um, where I think you can see um, what the author is getting at here. Um, I'm sure you think it unlikely that a modern building will contain such, much, uh, such mysterious areas as those alluded to above. Yet you should also recall that the new building you encounter today, as in the one over the quad, was constructed on the foundations of much older structures, and that the basement of the present building connects to the corridors and abandoned rooms of these previous institutions, and that some of these remnants of the previous architecture are still used for the archiving of seldom needed books and artifacts. Um, I was reminded of that rather strange novel, um, Gormengast, um, by, um, by, by Mervyn Peake, um, when reading this particular part. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that Gormengast is quite popular with the, the younger students. Um, it's giving them uh, some fantastical imagery um, with which to fill the rather mundane nights before they return back to study during the day. Um, when I was young, we thought it quite, quite exciting. Um, but I can see why the author would uh, be reminded of, of Gormenghast um, when, when thinking about uh, new buildings on top of older buildings, um, as if the architecture had almost grown on top of something. Uh, there's a nice drawing there by Mervyn Peak, who was also an artist. Um, I think it's quite quite interesting that a, a man uh, now chiefly known for um, a novel of the fantastic um, is, uh, was also an artist. Um, he did go mad. So uh, perhaps there's a lesson there that if one is an artist, one should not deal in the fantastic at the same time especially the literary fantastic. Um, I'm aware that I have no idea what time it is. What time is it? Five minutes left? Oh! oh I'm terribly sorry. I was going to leave some time for questions. Um, but uh, I appear to have run completely out of time. Um, and I have not even uh, got to uh, some of the other things I wanted to say. This is terribly embarrassing. Um, however, I will, I will continue to read from this text until, um, until the strange man in the front row waves at me, um, at which point I will stop. Um, and then perhaps... Um, Perhaps at a later date I could continue with this um, talk um, in, uh, in another institution if um, somebody will pay me. I, I do too much of this stuff for free um, and I, I, I do need to buy more books. Um, it was indeed while pursuing my own researches into the history of the institutions that once stood on this site, that is the site that the author was alluding to in the previous paragraph, 
and whose corridors are said to form part of the deeper sub-basements of the present building, um, one wonders if there are sub-basements in this building. That I first ventured into these moribund storage areas. I was searching for the diary of a Professor N, a professor of archaeology at the University of T. Um, those of you who are students of archaeology might understand the little jokes that are there. Um, who have submitted a number of papers to an obscure publication dealing with bibliomania at the beginning of the last century. Many of these articles dealt with the libraries of 18th century Dutch explorers and they demonstrated an almost obsessive focus on the fate of one particular collection of books of natural philosophy now thought lost. My interest in the professor's diary, that is the author's diary, not my interest in the professor's diary. I actually have no interest in this professor's diary. And indeed, in his interest in the whereabouts of the books collected by one Hieronymus Schlaken, had been kindled by the chance discovery of an ink and wash drawing of the local natural harbour, signed H. Schlaken. Um, some of you may indeed um, recognise the name Schlaken as being the name of a rather um, minor painter um, who uh, was uh, around at the time of Rembrandt. Um, Rembrandt uh, could not be described as a minor painter, I think. Um, Schlaken also turns up as a character in a ghost story by an Irish writer called Le Fanu. Um, which must be a strange experience to find oneself um, as a fictional character in a ghost story that draws on one of your paintings. Um, such are the jokes that history plays upon us. The man at the front row is looking at me as if he wishes to give me a drink. That would be rather nice. The drawings by Slarkin let me assume that he must have been employed as a draftsman on one of the voyages of exploration undertaken by Europeans in the pursuit of the projection of power, something the British had taken to perfection before their empire, like all empires much, must, had collapsed. Um, I think we can agree that this is um, fiction. That um, the British Empire will of course not collapse. Um, I think the author here is having a little joke uh, at his own expense and perhaps at the expense of others. Um, however, uh, we can assume that the British Empire will continue to spread the world red um, as is its God-given right. I assume that Schlagen had been like William Hodges before him both draftsman and spy, engaged in describing local flora and fauna while surveying the land for possible naval bases. Hodges is interesting. Um, if you go to the natural, uh, sorry, not the, the National Maritime Museum in Greenwich, um, there's one of the images now behind me, um, you will see these paintings that he produced um, on Cook's voyage um, to the South Pacific. They are extremely strange. Um, but then again, going to the South Pacific at that time was extremely strange. I am aware now that I have run out of time. Um, and there will be no time for questions from the undergraduates. Um, I'm terribly sorry if you wish to come and see me uh, in my room. Um, I will attempt to answer any of the issues that have been brought up by this short text um, and I hope that uh, you will perhaps uh, come and uh, listen to my next lecture um, which will be dealing with the, uh, the biology of a creature called Haloptothis ferox um, which does have a literary afterlife rather than being a mere biological um, um, creature. Uh, so I'd like to thank you all for coming to tonight's lecture. Um, the last image is now on the, uh, on the screen behind me. 
um, and I'm now going to go uh, and go to the um, the uh, the professor's room and get violently drunk. Thank you and good night. <laughs>